Hey, my name is Marcy Lundy. Today is Tuesday, February 15th, 2022, and this is the Cult of Kindness podcast. This week, I am very excited to do my second visual and audio recording, and this week, I'm so happy to welcome my sister, Michelle Sills. Michelle, welcome. Oh, hey, thank you for having me. Yes. Uh, what the Cult of Kindness podcast is, is a masterclass for those of us that are on a kindness journey. Uh, perhaps you feel as though you've never been kind, or perhaps you feel as though you've always been kind, but it's just for all of us. And I always include myself because I'm also on the kindness journey also. So uh, as I mentioned last week, that was a part one. And this is the part two about the color of kindness. And as it's Black History Month, I just wanted to have my sister on um, so that we could discuss uh, literally the color of kindness being women of color. So Michelle, uh, what does that mean to you in the world, being a woman of color and being kind? Hmm. I feel that kindness is probably something that's been a part of who I am for a long time, even as a child. I don't know if it has anything to do with being born under the sign of Libra. I don't know if that's <laughs> part of it. But um, I've always been a peacemaker, and that kind of goes hand in hand with kindness and promoting kindness. Always been someone kind of pulling for the underdog. Mm. Um, and being a woman of color, it's different from uh, when you look at the perspective of being a woman of color versus being a child of color. So yeah. as a child, Again, that was just part of my nature, kind of soft-spoken, and kindness wasn't necessarily always the most automatic thing that came to me as part of <laughs> my childhood experience, because you're always going to have bullies or people who feel like they might be able to take advantage of that kindness. Yeah. So as I grew, I learned, I had to learn how to put up probably good boundaries, um, understand understanding that I'm still generally a kind person but maybe the kindness comes out at different times it's <laughs> not always just an immediate this is where I grew now into a woman of color who is kind it's sure. not always the most maybe immediate or apparent thing it's always mm -hmm. there just below mm -hmm. the surface <laughs> but uh, you know, just to protect myself, <laughs> it's maybe not always the best thing to come out as so kind. I'm always smiling, but the kindness is a little more reserved now. Yes. And you're right. I remember uh, as a kid, you know, I was like very open and kind to people until the first experience when you come across someone that is not kind as a child. And then <laughs> It's like, okay, first I cry being this, mm -hmm. you know, open person. Mm -hmm. And then you're right, as an adult, like, then, then it was all messed up. But mm -hmm. you to get to a woman of a certain age, you're like, okay, mm -hmm. I know how to handle this. But it was super challenging as a child, like, that first experience. Right. And I also want to add to that part of my kindness as a child continuing on to this day is being empathetic. Mm -hmm. So that makes me very sensitive. Yeah. Like you mentioned, the crying will come, you know, mm -hmm. because maybe the child or the adult who's coming at you from a not so kind perspective is really in some kind of pain yeah. um, or suffering. So, you know, you're picking up on all that as well. And you're, you have to learn how to navigate that, you know, how mm -hmm. to really kind of see what's going on and address where is this person, re where's the root of this really coming from and yeah. being able to respond accordingly, um, you know, however it, it needs to happen. Sometimes the kindest thing you can do is to be direct and, uh, establishing those boundaries and mm -hmm. then once they understand that this is oh this is where I now stand you can come back right uh, with a little more of a kind perspective for sure did you feel growing up like uh when you were dealing with peers um did you 
like the first experience, let's say, where you dealt with a person who was cold or just a bully. Me. Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah. I'm trying to sugarcoat it. Like, <laughs> so, you know, like when that's your first experience as someone who generally is kind, uh, do you feel like that showed up on your face or were you able to power through? Do you think the person was able to see they affected you? Mm -hmm. I think for sure. I mean, in <laughs> elementary school, I went to school with other primarily brown and black children. Mm -hmm. And um, again, depending on what those children are dealing with in their lives at home, mm -hmm. maybe may coming at you with, uh, you know, feelings of maybe being intimidated if you appear to be, you know, smart, you're doing all your schoolwork, or maybe, uh, you know, the fact that my dad would pick me up and drop me off at school every day, yeah. maybe they, there wasn't a dad, you know, in their yeah. situation, there's all kinds of myriads of situations. But these were the people that I was coming into contact with. And for various reasons, these bullies had, um, you know, <laughs> justifiable cause in their eyes to <laughs> come at me in a way that was mean uh -huh. and of course they could see that I was you know someone who was afraid uh -huh. and um I had to learn how to handle that initially it was responding by going to the nurse's office uh, sure. I didn't feel well I was hating yeah. <laughs> easy that's only gonna go so far right you know? yeah. and I f remember one situation where <laughs> this was actually in kindergarten and I was just tired of it. So this one girl would bully me every day. Mm -hmm. Give me your, give me your milk, give me your whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and I would give it to her. And one day we were having tacos. I think that, you know, I love some Mexican food <laughs> like you. And I didn't want to give up my tacos, right. you know? And it was the first time I said, no. I'm eating my taco because she would always threaten like, and I'm going to kick your butt after school or whatever. Uh -oh. So I said, no, I'm going to eat my taco. Mm -hmm. And she didn't do nothing. And that was <laughs> the last day that happened. So that was a big lesson in itself. You know, sometimes yeah. you just stand up and say no, and that yeah. goes away. Maybe yeah. she was extra hungry. I don't know, <laughs> but uh, I had to learn a problem with her again. Was that Never it? I had a problem with her book asking for nothing off my lunch plate again. Wow. So <laughs> that was a big lesson. And, yeah. you know, maybe they're not going to go any further. Yeah. And there was another instance. And I will say there also were other children that I was in school with who were kind and my kindness was very welcome. And I was able to just be who I was because they were kind too. Sure. Um, but go, moving forward, maybe like into third grade, mm -hmm. um, I was having an issue again with this bullying situation. And it just so happened we had what was called like the king of the school back then. <laughs> so the king of the school, and he's one that is definitely roughing folks up. He's a bully. Uh -oh. Okay. <laughs> but he decided that he liked me and put Ooh. the word out. Nobody better not mess with me. Okay. So, <laughs> so <laughs> that was interesting because, oh, now I see I can find some protection, you know, from individuals who might not be so kind. Yeah. But there here's a little sliver of something. What is this? How do I yeah. how do I understand what this is now? Yeah. So that was another eye-opening um thing that happened but yes. in general <laughs> kindness was shown in our home um yeah. you know we were kind people throughout the family don't mess with us you know don't right. do many crazy things mm -hmm. but kindness was definitely part of the you know the the growing up uh perspective and injecting that into who we were absolutely I mean um you know, your brother-in-law and my husband, he thinks it's funny. He's like, you know, you guys are just like cut from a different cloth. <laughs> it's mm. like, it's like maybe, but also I think it helps us in the world. Like people identify there's something different, but I think mm. that once they realize, okay, but you know, they're cool, then mm -hmm. it's fine. 
you know, and it's yeah. so funny you brought up that story about the guy who had a crush on you and then he was like, you don't mess with her. Mm -hmm. I always remember when I was in high school, I had a friend Phyllis and she was from the South side of Chicago. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, we were friends and she one time skipped her class to come to a class where, uh, and I didn't even know that she knew that I had problems with some people in this class. Mm -hmm. She skipped her class after lunch, went to mine, sat in there and <laughs> she was like, Marcy is the most beautiful girl in this classroom. Mm -hmm. Let that be known. And, mm -hmm. and that's like, beautiful. Yeah. And I mean, I look for her to this day. I found her brother on social media. He said she's mm -hmm. not on there, but I mean, it was so sweet. And, you know, I was only like 15 or 16. Mm -hmm. And in an environment where, you know, maybe there was like four or five of us as mm -hmm. black girls at the school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I never asked her to do that. I didn't even know she knew I was being bullied. And mm -hmm. so that's it, amazing. It was. I mean, and then I think she didn't stay in there many minutes longer. She just went in there, made that declaration. <laughs> and mm -hmm. then, you know, I didn't have any problems with these people anymore. But, mm -hmm. you know, it was like, uh, Going That's to Washington, yeah, going to Washington State was interesting because uh, first that wasn't initially what we call home, you mm -hmm. know, that was our home state. Mm -hmm. So as a teenager, it was a lot of learning how to deal with uh, just the state mm -hmm. and the people within the state as teenagers. Yeah, it was a very interesting experience. That I mean, to this day, I'm just on the tail end of some of that you know, level of bullying, but mm. I think it's good when someone, you do have someone that has your back, like you were saying that it really helps. It does. Mm -hmm. I can also say that one thing that probably shaped us, um, both you and I as individuals was being protected for a long time and allowing us to maintain a level of innocence. Yes. And because you're not always coming into contact with situations that will grow you up and will kind of make you jaded or a little bit hard. And we had that for a long time. Mm -hmm. And that allows a person to have room to be kind if you haven't been getting hit with hard knocks so young. That's true. You know, uh, yeah. I feel in growing up in I, I'm 11 years, almost 11 years older than you. So mm -hmm. my growing up experience was completely in California. So by the time I got to middle school, high school, we had moved out to Chula Vista, which was very much integrated. You mm -hmm. know, there were there was everyone. But as a black girl, we were still in the minor minority as black kids at the yeah. school. Right. But where I found um, probably a lot of kindness and empathy was being able to move around and interact with so many other cultures. Yes. And it actually enhanced my level of appreciation for and interest in other cultures. And yeah. that uh, makes a space for you to then, you know, you're, you're not going through life with rose colored glasses on, right? But just having that extra dimension of understanding and because you've been kind of exposed, you've got friends of these different cultures, yes. that is something that's helpful, you know, and going out into the world, because you're going to hit it when you get into the workspace. Gonna oh be God, most yes. of the time, <laughs> you ain't going to be in the majority. Exactly. So it was helpful. I agree. Do you feel like uh, because you had that experience, and I agree, I totally have the same experience, uh, once you got into the work world and the real world, that it was easier to navigate? And do you feel like you came across, uh, let's say, do you, did you feel like you came across white people who didn't know how to receive you because you were relatable or did they feel like, oh, this is very comfortable, you know, because Michelle was kind and she's able to, you know, get on with all of us, you know, in an easy fashion. 
Mm -hmm. I feel going to school in a mixed environment was, again, really great practice for the real world, yeah. because initially you, you can find a lot of different things. People mm -hmm. who are expecting you to be one way because you're black. Oh, hey, girl, how you come at you? <laughs> you know, I really was not that. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't that cool most of the time <laughs> either. <laughs> and then you have people who may be a little standoffish. So I had been through all of that in my school experience. So when I got to the workplace, honestly, I could recognize it very quickly mm -hmm. and keep on doing what I had to do. Fortunately, I always felt pretty comfortable as who I was as an individual. So right. wherever they fell on whatever side of their perceptions didn't make much difference to me. I was going on marching straight ahead, mm -hmm. um, what I needed to do. Mm -hmm. And where it all, this is interesting. This is something I noticed with my daughter too. Mm -hmm. We always uh, being kind and, you know, kind of doing the right thing. You fall into favor with the elders, with yeah. your teachers, your That's supervisors. That's and as long as I was having good rapport with, you know, those individuals, what mm -hmm. was happening around, again, I'm observing what's happening, but it mm -hmm. didn't really have too much of an effect on what I was doing. Cause I knew um, my number one goal and mantra was striving for excellence. So right. whatever they were doing <laughs> or how they perceived me, a lot of times that changed yeah. because I wasn't so concerned about what they were thinking and I was just pumping out the excellence right so <laughs> they have to then accept you on those terms and right. that's all I that's all I'm doing so that's yeah. how you got to take me you know yes. Yes. and not wavering from that I feel uh, has always served me well that's right absolutely I, and as you were saying that, I just started to realize maybe it brought forward an element of maturity for us because uh, where we became aware of these situations that some people, one, never have to be aware of, mm -hmm. or two, from a very young age, you know, had a different experience. So they're aware in a different sense. Mm -hmm. And it gave us a level of maturity and comfort mm -hmm. as far as that was concerned. And I'm wondering if that's how, you know, like you said, uh, being able to get along well with elders and like the teachers and everything it's because you have this level of maturity that some of the other students didn't have could be i think it's just also an awareness and your mm -hmm. internal compass being aligned properly yeah. um i i know it's definitely a thing i love um austin channing brown i read her book last year mm -hmm. and uh, it talked a lot about having to, when you're growing up and you're kind of navigating two different worlds, you are a black person and you roll one way with black people. And then <laughs> when you get to your right, you know, surroundings, you kind yeah. of have to adapt, but being able to move fluidly through both of those worlds is definitely a tool that I've heard so many speak about, not just black people, Asians, mm -hmm. Indigenous folks, I mean, we all have to know how to navigate both if we're kind of going to recognize any level of success. That's true. And I feel it's a tool that maybe not all Black and Brown people have an opportunity to do growing up. Then right. if it's your first time experiencing that on the job or in college, it can be more challenging. I feel that's a, a real thing. Mm -hmm. And I see it more so as exercising a muscle, a tool, okay. something that right. we were able to practice before yes. you know we got to the grand stage of being adults. Mm -hmm. And I feel it definitely served us well. Absolutely. Now let's talk about something fun about having this experience of growing up uh, around many different cultures is, uh, I know we've laughed a couple of times about once we were able to get into an environment where it was largely uh, Black people, uh, not knowing songs that everyone else knew. <laughs> the dance steps. Yes. Yes. And <laughs> I remember like when we first moved to Washington State and, you know, I'm 15, I'm Black, you know, they are assuming I'm cool. And it was always a joke inside to me because I'm like, I'm one of the nerdiest people you could ever encounter. You know, I guess after a while they found that out. But initially, it was like some like, secret, like, ooh, yeah. they don't know. <laughs> like, I am so far from cool. And you know, it's like, 
I was okay with it then. I'm okay with it now. I feel like as an adult, like I really am okay with it. But I always thought that was so funny because like being a new girl in class as a black girl was very easy because they Mm -hmm. flock to you assuming you're cool, but you weren't. And uh, it wasn't necessarily the black people flocking to me. At first, Mm -hmm. there wasn't that many of them. It was the Mm -hmm. white people. (laughs) But Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) But I wanted to ask you, I think I know the answer. Don't you feel like it's fun uh, even though there were some words and dance moves we didn't know to songs and dances, but it's also very cool to introduce people uh, to songs that we know, or, mm-hmm. you know, like if we're singing a song that we learned maybe in school, mm-hmm. that someone who grew up differently, they have no idea how we even know that song. And it's mm-hmm. like, it's just kind of a fun added perk, you know? Yeah, <laughs> it gets more fun, I feel, as you get older. Now, yeah. I can remember in my family, I was not known as the dancer. I get out there and folks was <laughs> laughing, cracking up, because I'm doing all kinds of stuff with no rhythm. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, even, you know, I, I got, you know, cousins that you know accuse me that are still crack up at me when I cuss because you know Michelle it don't even sound right oh. when you trying to cuss and y'all know who you are uh-huh. so, <laughs> okay. so it's interesting because there is a thing where mm-hmm. when you've grown up in a more mixed environment you get accused sometimes of not sounding as culturally um, authentic yeah. as some other <laughs> Maybe you don't, like I said, do all the little dance moves, but that's right. okay. And it gets yeah. more fun. I'm gonna give you an example. So just uh, maybe a month or two ago, mm-hmm. we were hanging out with some neighbors and we were doing karaoke. Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, I definitely was right on point with Snoop, you know, and the two <laughs> but then I'm requesting to hear some Chris Stapleton, yes. <laughs> you know, yes. I'm in there with Sarah Bareilles, like what, like what? Yeah. what, you know, they look at me like what, and that is fun because mm-hmm. what it is, is you, you probably were underestimating me, and yeah, yeah I, I do know and <coughs> love a lot of what's considered traditional R&B, hip hop, or whatever you want to ascribe to Black culture, mm-hmm. but rest assured, I know a lot more, yes. so that is something that, you know, in the workplace or even in school environments, people may have underestimated, oh, oh, she, she actually she might know a little more than I gave her credit for. And yeah. <clears throat> that element of surprise is always something that I have enjoyed. And it I is fun it. because it's why not be the most well-rounded person you can be. Absolutely. Again, that's how you're going to make it getting around in this world. So mm-hmm. yeah, absolutely. That is fun. I know like, uh, I, to this day, walk around here singing songs I learned in elementary school and, you know, like, uh, Tucker is like, what is that? And how do you know that? <laughs> and like, and I admit, uh, growing up, I always felt like I was sort of missing out on something because I wasn't in a predominantly black school. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I remember years where I was like, I don't like the new kids on the block. I like the boys, you know, like, mm-hmm. you know, it was my own silent protest right. to connect yeah. to the community. Right. And, And, you know, as I became an adult, I realized, yes, but it's also a benefit, you know, that you also, you know, know who these groups are that, you know, some of your friends do not know who they are Mm -hmm. because they're white or they're Mm -hmm. Filipino, you know, so Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's a great added bonus. And I remember one time, uh, now we're going into just, you know, how we speak. Mm -hmm. So I remember one time you and your family came to visit us in Washington Mm -hmm. and uh, our dad had made some turkey Mm -hmm. and you were like, oh, this turkey is so delicious, you know, and then, you know, I teased you saying, oh, Michelle, you said that like you were doing a soap opera reader (laughs) and you said to me, well, what am I supposed to say? "Mm, This meat show moist, you know, (laughs) I remember that. (laughs) (laughs) It was so funny. And. You know, it's like, as I got older, then I realized my voice sounds more like your voice than I realized. So why did you get to a hard time? Like my voice was sounding the same way. <laughs> yeah. But I was like, 
wanted to ask if you also like the surprise of when you speak to people who don't know you for the first time mm -hmm. and the look on their face when they hear your voice. Mm -hmm. That has really happened a lot. Not so much lately because now in the past five years or so, we do a lot of video conferencing. So you mm -hmm. tend to see your coworkers or, uh, you know, if they work for a different company, you can see yeah. who they are. Yeah. But uh, back in the telephone days, you can go <laughs> years and people not know that you were black. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Just because, you know, they they didn't detect something in the way you spoke or what you were talking about. Right. So when they did see you, it would be a surprise. And mm -hmm. it was always like a smile, not, yeah. not a negative surprise. No. Wow, you sure mm -hmm. didn't look like I thought you. You, <laughs> looked, you looked very different from what I thought. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that's always been something that's kind of fun. Um, I think we have a combination of like our mother's animation as she talks mm -hmm. and then just the talking from growing up in various environments. So that's yeah. probably really interesting for other people to hear. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and different people hear different things because when it was more of a telephone connection with like coworkers, mm -hmm. I would hear, oh, are you from the South? What, what yeah. state are you from? Because again, the influence probably from my mom, our grandmothers, yeah. uh, they were had grown up in the South. And so we did have that little interjection of Southern hospitality. <laughs> I do at least, I don't know. I don't think I hear it so much in you, but uh, uh, people would say that, ask me yeah. that. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have it a little bit, I think, because I have some people who have said, oh, I love your accent. I'm like, I'm from Southern California. I don't have <laughs> That's the only South we're from, Southern I know. California. But I liked that. That was interesting. Mm -hmm. I even got an, um, one of my coworkers gave me the nomicker of Miss Charlotte. Oh, <laughs> I love that. Because <laughs> it sounded like I was from the South. Oh, I love that. Well, you do have, like, I know you have a lot of love for the South. And I think you did adopt, like, this charm and a way about you that probably is inherited from your grandmother and your mother. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I will say that my love for the South is completely through the lens of girl, coming as a descendant from these people who that's where they live, the food, the music, yeah. and, you know, a lot of the things that they were doing in the family. There's a whole culture around that. Um, yeah. Not this in the South, but mm -hmm. that is where my appreciation for Southern heritage comes through them. Absolutely. Yes, I love it. Mm -hmm. I think uh, I want to close out by asking you, in this day and age, uh, so many uh, children coming up, they have a hard time because if they are being bullied, it doesn't mm -hmm. end, unfortunately, when they go home. Um, mm -hmm. People create phony social media pages and it's just endless for them. So uh, as young Black girls coming up in an era where, you know, bullying goes beyond, you know, just simply being at school or work, yeah. is there anything that you would say in regards to giving them advice on how to keep your head up and stay strong? Mm -hmm. Number one, I would directly speak to parents monitor your children's activity and you cannot necessarily use the phone, the computer, the pad as a way to keep them occupied and the babysitter. You got to be on top of as much as you can. It's impossible, especially as they get older. You can't right. see everything, but really monitor what's happening in your home and what the devices are doing in your home. That goes a long way. That's one thing I would say, because it is is something you can't get away from it. Like by the, you know, if we were scared, somebody was going to chase us home. By the time we got home, it was <laughs> over, but yeah. you're right. It's not home. It's uh, the home can still be a very vulnerable place um, mm -hmm. that doesn't feel safe for a lot of, a lot of young people. So that's where I would start first is with the parents for young people. Um, and it's hard because they do want to be involved and see things but I noticed with Gen Z and their heightened sensitivities they would benefit from um, having healthy boundaries with digital media mm -hmm. and I feel that they're the first generation that will they'll show us having grown up under it completely they'll show us that you know what 
I'm 30 now. I am very much only, you know, limiting what my social media experience is. And I would also, as part of the color narrative, using colors as a means of protection, as a means of enhancing your moods. I am big time into uh, chroma therapy, color therapy, um, you know, understanding which colors are aligned with your chakras or with mm-hmm. different organs of your body. Yeah. And then as you're meditating or whatever you're doing to find peace, allowing yourself to imagine being bathed in a specific color, the color mm-hmm. that maybe you need for protection today. Maybe mm-hmm. you need a boost of energy. Maybe you're not feeling so well, so you're going to bring in some green, you mm-hmm. know, understanding how these colors can really affect you mentally, spiritually, emotionally, yes. and using that to help protect yourself or shield you or give you that extra boost of, you know, feeling a little happier uh, that you could adopt or borrow from using color therapy. Mm, that's beautiful. Mm-hmm. That's something I feel it's, it's tangible. It can, it can work. And again, a lot of these Gen Zers are already on top of that stuff. They've yeah. got their crystals. They yeah. understand what sign they were born and the, where the moon was and all these different things. And so yeah. that, those are things that I feel in antiquity Mm-hmm. As a human race, we use these tools right. and we've gotten away from them, but inherently understanding how to use them is something uh, that can go a long way to uh, helping us feel healthy overall. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah, and you're right. Uh, Gen Z is very on point with being fully aware. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Wonderful. Well, I think that that was a wonderful way to wrap this all up and yeah. uh, I really enjoyed having you on. This was a really fun conversation to have with my sister. Yes. (laughs) It was. Thank you for having me. This is great. Yes. I love you. And thank you so much for being on. I love you too. (laughs) Thank you for having me. Yes. I'll talk to you soon. I'll take care. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.